Uh, but uh, I've never taught it before, so this is going to be a bit of, a, a bit of an experience for both of us. Good afternoon, pupils. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Bruce. Okay, there it is. <laughs> uh, my name is Bruce Draconarius. Uh, I am the Battenberg Herald Extraordinary. Uh, I, uh, I used to be somebody important, but I got better. Uh, <laughs> you are well done, sir. Well done. Important. You no longer have an important position. I no longer have an important position. All right. And this class is going to be on the documentation from period sources, uh, or as I like to call it, getting your fix of the uncut stuff. <laughs> Just getting it in, in its pure form is, is, well, why do we do it? Why do we go, why do we want to look at period sources at all? Let's go to the next slide. All right. Why look at period sources? I mean, there are some excellent heroin books out there that have already looked at the period sources and condensed them for us. All right, why do we, we want to go to the period sources? Well, there's a few reasons. I mean, for any documentation thing, primary sources are always preferable. I mean, secondary sources may be extremely trustworthy, but they're still secondary sources. And do they, they do sometimes make mistakes. Tertiary sources, I mean, primary is always best for documentary purposes. All right, that this is a... Uh, thing that you learn in every arts and sciences competition in the SCA, and uh, it applies here just as well. All right, so primary sources are already best, and also studying the period sources gives you a better feel for period style. Once you've gone to, through 10,000 German coats of arms, you know what a German coat of arms is going to look like. All right, you get that, a feel for the motifs, you feel for the designs, a feel, a feel for the really weird stuff that they do, which if you take my regional styles class, you'll be able to see. So, <laughs> all right, uh, and if you're actually doing something for submissions, like for example, you're documenting a new charge or you're documenting an IAP, which for those of you who don't know, that's for individually attested practice, which is something that breaks our core. Yeah, pattern, practice, whatever. Which breaks our core rules, but still was done in period, but you need to document it before you can have it. Um, you definitely need to go to period sources for that. I mean, we're not going to let anyone get to period sources. And finally, there's the feeling of power that comes with knowledge. <laughs> yes. What's the saying? Power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And knowledge is power. So study and be evil. Absolute power is kind of cool. It is kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure someone's I'm done sure. that. Would you like the door closed? That yeah. might not be a bad idea. Uh, this is the last, this, I mean, this is the last chance to welcome new, newbies in. Anyone did not, by the way, just to repeat, anyone who did not get one of the handouts, uh, talk to me. I've got it on my projector. I've got the, uh, it's a, it's a, a Word document. There's a few in the center of the room there. All right, and, uh, two, so. All right. So if you, it's just a bunch of bullet points. There's, there's nothing really detailed on it. Feel free to scribble on that handout because I'm going to be talking about stuff that's not explicitly in the handout. Right. So next slide. So there are essentially four sources for period sources, that, types of period sources that we can look at. And going from, in my opinion, the most trustworthy to the least trustworthy, we have period grants of arms, we have armorial displays, you know, somebody was actually using the armory somewhere. We have rolls of arms, and we have period heraldic treatises, what we call the tracts. Right? And all these have their advantages, and all these have their disadvantages. I'm going to be going over them in, in, in bit by bit. So let's start with the first one, period grants of arms. Period grants of arms are the awesome. All right? there, there, there is no better resource that we can have for a variety of reasons. First off, the artwork is generally of much better quality than we're going to see in the other, other sources. This makes sense. We actually are paying a herald painter to actually do this. All right? All right. We have a period depiction of the arms. We have the period text of the blazon. We actually have the period text of the uh, entire grant. Um, and the most valuable thing of this is all, it is authoritative. This is what they did because we have the Guard King of Arms saying that this is the way it is. All right? So, okay, where are we on this particular one? Okay. Set of War d'Azur, a pure party per pal, so per pale, uh, azure and purple. A trois test de Lusa, and then you see it right in there, raise, which means uh, three. Lucy's heads raised, uh, door, uh, angle. Angoulans, trois fer de lance d'argent, so swallowing three spearheads, argent. Uh, et la façon des Gaules, in the Welsh fashion. 
<laughs> I have no idea what that means. <laughs> but, 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 that's what it looks like. But that's what it looks like. That's what it happens when you swallow a spear in the Welsh fashion. Right? Don't you try it in the, in the French fashion. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> but in the Welsh fashion, that's what swallowing a spear looks like. I'd Apparently love to see that's what, what argent and purple look like after after 400 years. Because this is like 14, 500, 500 years. years. This is like a yeah. this was a, 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 a grant of arms to a Welshman, so which is probably why it says in the Welsh fashion, granted in 1492 by uh, Jean Rai, autrement dit Jean-Pierre, roi de dame de Anglois. I'm, no, I'm butchering the French. I'm very sorry. I'm glad I there it is. Wonder if there is a Story, a Welsh story that the guy knew about a fish swallowing and spearhead or something. Could, could maybe be. Um, uh, a lot of Welsh uh, coats of arms did allude to a fa uh, family tradition, like the one who has little boys' heads being strangled by snakes. But we're not getting into that. <laughs> All right, then. All right, then. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a reason the English conquered them. <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Let's take a look at a one somewhat later, the grant of arms to Thomas Cawthorn in, in 1553. I love this one because uh, it provides us with the documentation for the charge we call a, a shot loop or a calopus in period. It's kind of like a, 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 a wild cat with horns. All right, and it's in his crest, and it is uh, the heads are in his his arms as well. So, where where are we in here? You're here somewhere. I'll find you. All right, there we are. Ghouls on fess. This was actually in English. Ghouls on a fess in grailed silver. Three hawthorn branches in their proper colors. Uh, between three uh, calypus heads. Raised argent, horn or horn gold, excuse me, horn gold, and then it, it goes on to describe the crest and the colors of the mantling, and uh, so this is if we this is the documentation for this charge. All right, it is absolutely authoritative. The so disadvantage the disadvantage to grants of arms is that they are in fact authoritative. Therefore, you will only find them in places that have authorities. They were, are not, you are not going to find any period Italian grants of arms. Uh, sorry, you're not. Uh, for, our intents and for our practical purposes, this is mostly limiting us to English. All right? Might have a couple of Scots, might have a couple of Hungarians. I know of one grant of arms from the Holy Roman Empire, maybe a couple of Spanish. All right? But by and large, all of our examples of period grants of arms are going to be English. Uh, one more. Um, hmm. I've been watching on... Netflix, a show called Monarchy, mm -hmm. and it starts in 500, and they've just gone through the War of the Roses. What is, and they showed that double rose, and I can't remember the name the, of the, it. The Tudor rose. The Tudor rose. rose. That's Thank one you. of the very many forms of the Thank Tudor you. rose. You could also have it a white one with a little red one inside, or you have it divided into a pale, have red. Okay. And Thank you. We're, we're, we're oh, I know that was his name. Okay. The other disadvantage to period grants of arms is finding them. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah uh, there's not a lot of collections of them all in one place. Right? Well, that makes sense. Somebody made a wonderful piece of work of art and then handed it to the recipient, who then took it home mm -hmm. and promptly buried it in his paperwork, probably. But you know. But uh, the point 500 is, years 500 years later, somebody found it. Uh, the only ones we have are the ones that actually got preserved. Uh, uh, many of the company guilds of London, for instance, uh, very carefully preserved their grants of arms, and that's why they're available today. Why uh, a lot of our documentation for those grants is from the guilds of London. Uh, but as for the others, you're not going to find a collection of them, I'm afraid. So you're going to have to go hunting. But that's half the fun, isn't it? You can find the British Library. They pop up in various books, but you have to go through the books probably one by one. To one find by one. Mm -hmm. find the end. I don't have all the catalog. Yeah. I ran across. Yeah. The go, go, go back a slide. This, uh, this grant from Hugh Vaughan, that's in the British Museum. British Library, it's in, so. so yeah, somebody actually found that and donated it rather than let it be lost, which I think is a, a good thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's period grants of arms, and they are kind of by definition of the most reliable source we have. I would think another disadvantage is that there really is only one coat of arms per document. Usually, but, and, but and notice so in this particular case, he, he's also been granted a standard yeah. and, and a crest. 
you can't really see it, but it's described in the, in the text here as having the standard of a guy, a guy standing in a in a in a white circle with black tights, holding a holding a sword, a knife. A, 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 oh yeah, yeah. All right. They got kind of forward. What can I say? All right. Am, am I? Is that is that going to work when I step over and do this? It's like. Mm. I mean, you're. I'm trying. I'm trying to be. So you have plenty of angle to be within now, and right. you can. Yeah, you can step in front of it if I need to. All right. I'm trying to use the laser pointer because. No. You know, no. Go. I don't think it blocks the laser. All right. Let's go forward then to the next one, which is heraldic usage. Now, heraldic usage is just what it sounds like. Uh, how did people actually use the heraldry? All right. There was a class on that earlier today. Uh, it turns out that they use heraldry in a whole bunch of ways, and these have the advantage of usually being uh, very good artwork, because you know somebody paid for this. Yeah, so you're going to give them the best work. So the first one, for example, this is uh, heraldry in illumination from the hours of Catherine Cleves. So this was like the first page of the book of her book of hours, and her the arms of her four great grandparents are floating there on, in the corners with her own personal arms as the Duchess of Gelder right there in the center. Um, There's a really funky yeah, so, elm crest. What, what, this one? No, the monster face in the It's a bull. It's not the bull's head. Yeah, the bull's head of Cleves, right? Okay. And then we have Bavaria down there. And then we have uh, Mark. And then we have, uh, what is it? Leibniz. Yeah. Which, and what's the crest? That's a cradle. <laughs> It's a checky cradle. It's a checky cradle, but it's a cradle. And then we have her personal arms uh, with uh, as Duchess of uh, Gelders in one side, and then her family in the other. All right, and that's usually a good quality. When you can find uh, next slide, please. Uh, book plates, uh, particularly Albert Durer book plates, because you know you don't get better than Albert Durer. Uh, these are the coats of arms of Johannes Cherta. Uh, it is a it is a pun. Uh, the, the gentleman in question was Hungarian, and Chert means savage in that tongue. And so we have a naked hunter. Because, <coughs> you know, if you're naked, you're a savage. Mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not completely naked, he's wearing sandals, and that's what make him, makes him savage. That actually shows up in Roman motifs. Oh, okay. And frequently portray the savages as naked except for except sandals. Except for folk bear. Uh, don't ask me why. I don't know. <laughs> Even savages don't like to step on rocks. Um, particularly when you're running and chasing something. All right. Uh, next slide. Uh, then we have uh, funerary heraldry. There is a book called Monumental Brasses, which I believe I included in the uh, in the sources thing on the last page. If I did not, my my apologies. But essentially, it's just a collection of funerary brasses, in, mostly in England. But uh, always, they very often they will show. Not only the heraldry, but the style of jupon that uh, you would supposed to be wearing while you're while you're displaying the heraldry, uh, and that's it. Those are good stuff. This is just these are just examples. There are wall carvings. There are next slide. There are stained glass. <laughs> All right. All right. You'll find a lot of stained glass, which is a uh, so yes, yeah, so this broken stuff. So, uh, but again, these are excellent examples of pure heraldic art. So these are trustworthy from that point of view. The emblazons are very frequently of good quality. The disadvantage is we only get the, the emblazon. We don't get a blazon for any of these. We have to go find it. And usually they don't like this one. doesn't have any guy's name on, so we don't know where to go to look it up. All right. There are ordinaries that we can, that we can start the search from, but it, it, it helps to actually know, know when this was built and who, and who was doing it. So um, that's the disadvantage. We don't know what they were called. We know what they, were, they look like. And again, we don't have a collection of all the heraldry on all the buildings of all the places in one book. You have to go hunting for it. Uh, what the ones that I've just cited you came from a book of hours, and a book on book plates, and a book on stained glass. All right? But again, that's part of the fun. Go and a book on funerary brasses. And a book on funerary brasses. Yeah, but there it is. Third source. Rolls of arms. Now, this is really exciting because the number of online rolls of arms has just exploded in the last 10 years. I mean, we've got so much more in this resource than we ever had before, right? And this makes things possible we could never do before, all right? So let's go. Rolls of arms essentially come in four, five flavors, depending on what you want to call them. We have the occasional rolls of arms. We have institutional rolls of arms. All right, let me explain. I have occasional roll of arms is a roll of arms that was put together to mark everyone who was attending a particular event at that occasion. 
And occasionally, that, that, an example of that would be the parliamentary rules of 1514, for instance. You know, all the peers who had parliament just before it got disbanded. <laughs> Um, then we had institutional roles, which were like all the coats of arms of all the people who attended, you know, Oxford this year, something like that. Regional roles are very common, you know, this, these are all the arms of the nobles of the Holy Roman Empire, these are all the arms of etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. And there were even teaching roles of arms, illustrative roles of arms. And finally, there are general roles of arms, which usually are, get commissioned, and we'll get to that in a minute. But this is an example of a blazon-only rule of arms. This is the Camden rule, it's like 1260, 1280, thereabouts. And uh, it's got nothing but blazons. That's all we've got, no pictures. Right? This is awesome if you know how to interpret this. All right, so if you read old French here, you're in like Flynn. Otherwise, you know. If not, you must clear. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm sure she'd be happy to interrupt whatever she's doing she to come and answer your question. Done so, she may have true. already done so, and that's the truth. <laughs> uh, next slide. And some of them, most of them, the majority of them, are pictures only, no blazons. Right? And these are, these are the ones that, uh, that cover all, there is no time period in which we cannot find a roll of arms uh, of the emblazon style that shows us the arc. Now, this is the dairy roll from 1280. It's one of the earliest heraldic rolls we've got. And then Let's go to the next slide. Uh, there's the Zurich Wappen Roll from Switzerland, the next century over. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of degraded with time, but uh, the arms are perfectly good. Those are the arms of Helfenstein. That's an elephant, believe it or not. That's a bathtub. <laughs> How do you know that's a bathtub? Uh, I know that's a bathtub because the, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump ahead a little bit. I'll answer the question. Many of these rolls of arms are published in books real live dead tree books, all right? And when, they're, when that happens, usually somebody edited them, and the editor will frequently include uh, blazons. Right? Sure. That, that makes sense. In this particular case, I know that's a bathtub because Michel Popoff says it's a bathtub. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that's so a contemporary they are publishing? Uh, yes, contemporary modern publishing of a period source in which somebody went in and actually did the research that I wish I could do. Right. Yeah, and you know, so, you know, you can trust their research. They, they, yeah, and Michel Pastoreau, Michel Popoff, yes, you can trust their research. Yeah. yeah. You know, the two preeminent French heraldic authors alive today. Okay. All right, uh, that's a drinking horn. Because my next question would have been, how do you know that the editor knew that that was a bathtub? Um, in this particular case, I read enough of his other works that I know that it's a bathtub. Okay. That I, that I trust him when he says it's a bathtub. Logical fallacy, right. killed with authority. Sorry. No. Uh, next page. <laughs> All right. Then we are uh, jumping on the head another century. We have the Stamaro Tavoziano. This is a Milanese roll, uh, circa 1460 or thereabouts. All right. And uh, we will talk a bit more about the style of Italian heraldry in, in my other class. But, uh, Sometimes we just get to play what's that charm. What the heck is that? And what the heck were they thinking? And did they bring it up to share with everybody? And it's like, uh, <laughs> and, like three sardines? <laughs> Well, there are three fish, nine, counter nine, nine again. Which is an arrangement we don't see a, a lot of in the SCA. Now, hey, congratulations, we've not documented it. Yes. Okay, I expect to see this in the next one. All right, we have, we've got, got, we've got a lion, bendy, ghouls, and argent. We've got, you know, another tree. Oh, that's a griffin. You know, also the same. A winged wolf, are we sure that's a griffin? Um, I thought it was a griffin. griffin. I think it's a griffin. It looks it's got, like it's got, eagle, it's got eagle claws. It's got eel, okay. yeah, that's a griffin. Okay. Okay. Right. On the other hand, it's a very simple charge. Yes. Uh, the, the quality varies. Let's go to the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is one of my favorites. This is uh, Mitchell Roberts' Nice Gift of Boppen book. And that takes us to the next century, the 1550s. All right, Vigil Roberts was uh, a, uh, an indefatigable uh, heraldic artist of that time. And he's done this. Uh, any of you who have been online to the, uh, to the, uh, roll, of, the roll of arms of the Arlberg Brotherhood of St. Christopher? It, it's in your <laughs> He did most of that artwork as well. So it's like, and he's an excellent heraldic artist. And again, we see, um, well, it's pretty, pretty darn good work. Yeah, there's Medici up there. There's uh, Denmark, Sweden, you know, Scandinavia. Uh, there's uh, King of uh, Sicily, I think. 
Napoli? Napoli? Napoli. It says Kingdom of Naples. It has the same people as ours. Naples, yes. I'm pretty sure that's Napoli. Okay. But they were also the titular king of Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. Which happens. All right. So. Is one underneath it, does that say King of Arabia? Yes. Yes, it does. All right. Obviously. All right, well, let's talk about the advantages and the disadvantages of the Barnes in. Okay. All right. As we have seen in these examples, the quality of the artwork is variable. All right. And I'm showing you some good ones. All right. There are some of those German rolls online that I was talking about a moment ago that I don't like to use because they look like they were drawn by a five year old on a sugar high. And, uh, <laughs> My sugar high five year old made some glorious rolls. Oh, I'm sure. I, would, I, I said A, hey, not you. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, so, so, in addition to not always having the blazon and the emblazon together, and you'll notice that none of these had both, uh, the artwork can be extremely variable. And in some cases, you know, made up. King of Ethiopia. And now that doesn't stop us from using fire dogs, which were the attributed arms of the King of Ethiopia. But, uh... Oh, yeah, so, so we know that pe medieval people thought that was a reasonable choice. Medieval people thought those were the arms of the King of Ethiopia, and that's good enough for us. <laughs> All right? So, uh, the, but the advantage is that having collections like this makes it easier to actually find stuff. Yeah. All right? Because you can be pretty darn sure that just about anything in, from Europe, from Italy, or southern Germany is going to have them arms on it somewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they were all over the place. All right, let's keep going one more. Okay, now here's a wonderful example uh, of a roll of arms that has both blazon and emblazon. When you can find those, those are gold. Right. This is the Grand Memorial Collier. It was a French roll from the 16th century. I selected the part that it was divided territorially. And this is the part of uh, Gascony, or, or Guillaume. Guillaume. All right. And we have, here's the arms, here's the blade. Let's see if I can do it. Le Duc de Guillaume Porte de... Yep. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was in the middle. Le uh, Porte de Gules, uh, Le Pas d'Or, Arme et Lampice d'Azur. Lampice is another word for land. Mm. Yeah. So, even though he, doesn't, arm he doesn't have a blue tongue. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, they, you know, I didn't say they were perfect. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, but anyway, uh, so at all of these, and this, is, this just goes on for pages and pages, it's wonderful, wonderful stuff. Awesome. If, you, if you can read the handwriting. What's the secondary charge on the top one? The, those are, oh, okay, uh, uh, well, let's take a look. Uh, il sont, uh, d'or à un croix d'azur, uh, and an estranger a quatre Merlot Martlets. Du men of the same. So. Yeah, I was going to say, I was guessing Martlets because they didn't have feet. They didn't. Yeah. They don't have feet, they don't have beaks. French, French Martlets frequently don't have beaks. Oh, All right. All right. That's, why, that's why they're not... They're, they're not Martlets, they're Merlot, which was the, the druid of Blackbird, really. The, 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 the French Merlot and the... And the and, uh, the English charge kind of got conflated uh, at one point. The only thing they all have in common is no feet. Next slide. And they start with an M. And they start with an M. And then we have, uh, let's get back to English, please. The Walters Roll of 1589. Uh, uh, he obviously had plenty of room, so I chose one here. And essentially, there's the emblazon there. So Henry, so Henry Compton, he bears the sable, a lion. Passant garden in fest or between three helmets argent. Yep, that's what it is for. I included this one because this one was a commissioned roll of arms. It was commissioned by this, the, the dispenser family. Uh, and uh, so if you go through the thing, there's a lot of dispensary stuff going on in that. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, that one pales compared to the next one, please. The Ehrenbuch de Fugger of Augsburg of 1545. How many of you know who the Fuggers were? The Fuggers were a really rich mercantile family who did bunches of favors to the poor nobility. <laughs> and as a result, uh, they became, they intermarried and they got very, very powerful. And when they commission a roll of arms, by God, it's going to be a work of stunning art. It's worth it. Right. So that, that's the Fugger arms right there. In fact, that, those two fleur de lis, that's the original Fugger arms. 
Then they kind of married into these two, and then they married into Saxony, and then, you know, boy. Uh, so, um, I can't vouch for the accuracy of the portrait blanket, but, uh, and this one doesn't have, this one does, does not have blazons, it only has emblazons, but the emblazons are awesome. So, so what is the writing above then? Is I believe it, I, it's, ide it's identifying the people involved and when they died, and I'll go 1547, yeah, this is... It's, 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 it's 1547, it's, the book is not from 1545. Huh? If they're dating something to 1547... 1547, the book is probably not from 1545, that's true. Well, there's another thing that says over the 1539 in the other panel. Yeah. So All right, it, circa it, 1545. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Plus or minus, you know, margin of... century, yeah. <laughs> there's a margin of error, give me a break. All right. We also don't know how long it took for this to actually get done. Huh? Sure, we also don't know how long. Yeah, 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 they started in 15. Or they could have also updated it, you know. That's also true. In fact, they almost later. certainly did as yeah. more cougars got born. Uh, so those are our rules of arms. And as I say, well, they have the advantage, the tremendous advantage. We have so many of them that uh, it's just a, it's our, one of our most valuable resources. Last on our list of four are the heraldic treatises. There were period heraldic treatises starting as early as... Uh, as uh, well, the Book of St. Albans in 1485, uh, there were some earlier than that, uh, but let's go next slide. But here's an example of the Traité de Laisson in France in the 15th century. Um, they had the advantage of, you know, having both pictures and text. They have both the emblazons and the blazons together. Uh, the disadvantage is these aren't necessarily arms that anybody actually used. All right, okay, you, you, um, unless they come out and say this was born by the Duke of Cumberland or something like that, you can't guarantee that these are arms that anyone actually used. Uh, the guy is making it up uh, for illustrative purposes because this is educational. Yes. But could you not? You can then, yes, you can then use, you can still in the SCA use this as documentation for what period heralds thought was a good charge. And nine times out of ten, that will work just fine. I mean, we use a, one of these treatises to de document the Ark of the Covenant as a period heraldic charge and got it through. Only one so far. All right. The disadvantage of these is that the quality of the emblazons is extremely variable. All right. uh, a lot of them aren't nearly as fancy as those. A lot of them are woodcuts. A lot of them uh, are describing charges that you know for a fact that the person only is, is working on hearsay. <laughs> Because you know that's not what's what an elephant. What's what's a camel leopard? You know, you know and, and you so you're not gonna, you can't take them 100. percent You have, must have a copious supply of salt nearby when you read the things because you just can't accept what they are on the just on the face of them. Uh, this one is in French. Let's go to the next one. Les ex, les uh, Jardins Exines of Armory is a an important one in English. Uh, times because so many of his successors quoted him, right? So it's a very influential source. Uh, you've got to understand that, you know, the heraldic treatise uh, writing process really took off in Tudor England, all right? That's when we we're uh, suddenly elevating a whole bunch of nobodies into gentlemen, and they all needed to know that armory. Um, the Book of St. Albans, which is 1485, was one of the first ones that, that was doing that, and it covered the three H's that every uh, gentleman needs to know. Hunting, hawking, and heraldry. Right? Every gentleman needed to know those three things. Didn't know how to, have to know how to tie his own shoes, but he had to know that. All right. uh, and then more heraldic treatises came on, and toward the uh, Elizabethan times we have this, we have uh, John Boswell's works of armory, and culminating in Willem's display of heraldry, which is just <coughs> that period, but close enough for government work. So Lee's ex ex accidents of armory, and by the way, that is not accidents. That's, that word does not mean accidents. That word means exceedance, or, or the things we follow, like precepts. All right. Accidents of army. I'll grant you some of the emblazons. And this is that. also printed. And this is also printed. So you can okay. actually read the words much better. Yeah. So let's go to the next page. And here's what a page would look like. All right. The field is or a fion azure, which signifieth the head of a dart. This is a perilous weapon. <laughs> and then he goes on to explain the signification of the charge. And then, the field ghouls a right-handed pale archer, the right hand at the name of 
gift is, as Isidore saith, and that the surety of peace is given with the same and is witness of faith. Blah, 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 blah. All right. Yeah, I have to say, when I'm actually using this for heraldry, I tend not to go past the first sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there, there, is, there is no point, and I will, and I will get to, to that part as well. Uh, Although but, this does tell us that the whole meanings behind heraldry is not just a Victorian conceit. Yes and no. All right. But this All right. Would be on a Once again, let me jump ahead just for a moment. I'll come back to it in more detail in a moment. But it boils down to one of the reasons this is not tr as trustworthy as the others is that it's full of opinions. Not necessarily valid opinions. <laughs> His opinions. His opinions. <laughs> opinions. Which might, you know, yeah, and their their opinions. But you know, not necessarily valid. Yeah. Uh, next page. Uh, finally, we're ending up with Willem's display of heraldry. The first edition was 1610, which was after Elizabeth died. So you know, technically speaking, not in our period, but close enough to the end of our period that many of the things we see in here are valid representations. And Willem actually names names. Well, I'm actually say these are the coats of arms that belong to the family of Bruder. Right. And on top of that, for a while there, this was available in facsimile for not too much money. Right, and now it's available. Well, no, this version is not available. No, not the color version. I got a black and white off the, of Amazon. No, 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 the first edition is not available. Yeah. I can't find it. Oh, no, I'm pretty sure it's not the first edition. Okay. I can go. So here's, a, here's what a page of Willem would look like. So he, he beareth Archant, a trivet sable by the name of Trivet. You know, so we have trivets, and we have flesh pots, and we have bellows, and we have lamps with a label. All right. So the original was not colored in, by the way. The edition that I that I got this copy from, somebody had actually gone in and colored all the emblazons, but the original was black and white. So. That's a lamp. These are lamps. Yes, those are period lamps. Okay. Well, have we actually written the lamp? Not, not, not of that form, but it's not for lack of trying on my part. That's a damn sure. <laughs> Some, something I should think about because you know I have that book. Okay, you should, yeah, you should definitely have a lamp. You want documentation for a lamp? I've got like wads of it. Um, no, I'm not really looking for new armory, but you know, I'm at this, I run console tables. Okay, fine. Get somebody to have a period lamp, please. It's found in the arms of Witwang. It's found in the arms of That's the name. I might be able to get somebody to register that name. <laughs> <laughs> we managed to get someone to register Fall in the Well, so, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, so we can do anything. But. So, you did get someone to these, are, these are essentially yes. our so sources, our four kinds of sources in order of decreasing reliability. All right, next page. All right, so now that, we are, now that we're armed, now that we've got the things we want, what do we do with them? All right, well. One of my favorite pastimes, as I'm sure many of you know, is looking for charges that have met, never been registered in the SC84 and telling people about them. I love that, by the way. And, All right. or, or, and right. or registering them yourself. Or registering them myself. Yes, I, I registered them, or because nobody else was getting an off the stick and doing it. I, I, was, probably, I was the first. I finally did a werewolf just because you, you've been pushing it for so long. Yeah, you, know, you, got, my, you got a werewolf. Where, where, yeah, I werewolf. Got, period. Wait, or I like charge. I got the Alicamelus oh. badge. You got the Alicamelus. Uh, somebody uh, was the, the, one of the talkers that say he had the sole of a shoe. I think it just got registered. Yeah, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. a punter. A punter. Yes, Cormac yes. has a punter. Uh, of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, next page. All right, so these are some examples of charges that we have registered from just going through the sources and finding new stuff. All right, so we have the punter. A cross acorn? A cross uh, glandular, I believe is the term. Okay. A cross glandular, it means acorn. And a crampet. A crampet, gosh, yeah. I didn't do, it. I didn't do that one. You know, Lilia did that all on her own. You know, I'm not the only person doing this. People are going out there and finding stuff. A rake, which is ready to lady. Yeah, my lady? Didn't she? No, no she, she, she had a Wolkoff. This is the district of Elio Wolkoff uh, down in Calafia. Yeah. Aries has been. Frying pan. Of course. Uh, and a heraldic I a monster called an ibex, not to be confused with the mountain goat. Mm -hmm. This is what an ibex looked like in the That's why there is a multi section that's taking precedence on what the difference between an ibex and a natural ibex is. Yes. Yeah. And these are just some of the examples of things that we have found by going through the sources. So, what do we, how do we go through the sources? Well, unfortunately, there's no shortcut. Page. By page. Oh, or scan. Yeah, yeah. Or, or scan by scan. Crosses, crosses, lion, crosses, lion, crosses, mullets. Oh, that, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. that's, that's it. That's exactly what you do. I, uh, I, uh, I do a lot of travel. I'm on an airplane for hours at a time. And that's hey. where I find the time to do this. So, <laughs> 
All right, next slide. These are some documented period heraldic charges still waiting for registration. No, these are all documented. I can document the Wahoo, and nobody's got them yet. What are they? I hear you cry. Is it that basket of plummet? This one? No, above it. That, that is a boy. Okay. Oh, that is a boy. Oh, it belongs to, uh, to Baron Abergavenny, uh, who one of his ancestors was an admiral. That's a badge. That's a badge. That was his badge. And you could, you could have it, but you could have it too, right? Uh, the uh, hand drill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one's got that. Uh, that's the sliding bolt of a door. <laughs> These are fish wheels. You know, fish traps. Throw, throw them in the river, come back a day later, they're full of fish. Uh, that's an axle that's bracket. That's a great Irish charge. Mm -hmm. If they're trying to convince bracket? somebody not to do a Celtic knot, fish trap. Well, they're not really woven, they're just like wicker. Yeah, I yeah. guess. Actually, I should, check, I should see if my fishing laurel might want to throw those in as an extra charge. Works for me. <laughs> and uh, this is a flax tackle. I mean, he's a got the fish hooks. tackle. But Oh, yeah, yeah, so you have got uh, two yeah, uh, so poles. No, you, you put your foot in one end, you hold it with the other, and you go <laughs> across all these spikes in the middle. It's a flax hackle belonging to the family of heckling. <laughs> yes, heckling. All right. all right. That, by the way, is one of the ways you can identify these new charges. All right. Obviously, without, embla without blazons for these emblazons, we don't 100% know what they are just right out the front. I mean, I've had people say, oh, it's obviously like, you know, the tailpipe of a car, right? Uh, <laughs> you, it's, I didn't know they invented YouTubes for, for toilets that early. It's like you know, blah blah. No, you look at the name, Katanachi. A Katanachi is, is, is the Italian for a sliding bolt. All right. Canting is by far the most common uh, method of selecting charges in period armory, and therefore, Always, always look at the name and see if the name can give you a clue as to what is this charge. Yeah, particularly since weird charges like this, it's almost always name. Yes. Yeah, it's almost always name. So, so von Heckling has a has a hackle. Yeah. So, uh, but that's just one method of, of looking them up, but uh, it's the most reliable. Um, Is one under Sala? Sala? That's a that's a wagon axle. Oh. Somebody who's a mechanic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they could have uh, some, some green goods underneath it. Mm -hmm. A good wheel, a drop of oil. Mm. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. And finally, next page. These are charges I haven't been able to identify yet. All right. So, yeah. What the heck is that? A back scratcher? No idea. No. This one's even English, and I still can't figure out what that is. This looks like wolf's teeth. Wolf's teeth, maybe, but I can't. What's the name? Uh, Lekowel. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's nothing. Yes. Yeah. Right. That thing. It looks like the, the badge for the Order of the Cruciform Sword from you know Indiana Jones, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, German. Okay. I wonder if it's a carryover from the Polish. It could well be. Uh, the, the, I, I've included the names of all of these guys. So that if you want to like, you know, write them down and take them home and help me out here. That one, the, the best anyone's been able to say is it might be a churn. Yeah, it looks like a sand mixer. Yeah, except that, you know, a churn usually goes and then there'd be a prank put in there. There is. No, no, there'd be a crank. There's a handle. There's no crank. And it's the it's the crest as well as And it's the crest as you see. It's gotta be the name. Uh yeah, but we've tried every variant we could think of. And and then this one, what is that? An urn of ashes? That's what I thought. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. okay, okay, that's a what's the name? I'm guessing it's a girl. The name is uh from Margareta Calter Henson. Something, something. What's the name on the cement mixer? Oh, that is <laughs> The hint? Uh, the, yeah. the, the, the hint. No, hint. 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 Yeah, I think that's a U with an umlaut over it. Yeah. The hint. 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 No idea. And we, and we tried. We, we, I know. I mean, haven't lost hope. Might find it someday. Uh, but in the meantime, I can't really offer these to anybody, can I? You know? I mean, you'd have to be some kind of like lunatic to offer somebody a heroic charge that you couldn't identify, right? Cormac. Cormac. <laughs> <laughs> so then, yes, what you're talking about, but you said you have to be a lunatic and you're talking about Cormac. Yes. 
All right, so. You notice no one disagreed with no you. No one did. So that, that is, that is, this is my hustle. This is the fun, this is the fun part of Harold. You're finding new stuff. All right, and you, you never know where you're going to find it. So once you've identified it, then, it, then it's a trophy to hang on your wall, and you can get somebody to actually register the thing. Oh, yeah, that's great. That's yeah, also nice, better than when someone says, I want this implement that we probably was not used in period heraldry for good reason. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah. As my rolling pin example shows you. Um, it's a stick. All right. All right, moving on, next uh, slide. The second reason for using uh, going to period sources is uh, individually attested patterns. <clears throat> I don't know what it means, you see. All right, uh, essentially for those of you who, who may not be aware, we had a core style in the SCA and anything that follows that core style can be registered with very little difficulty, uh, barring conflict. But to get something from outside that style, you need to document it, and not only document that it happened, that one person had it, but document that it was, that it was sufficiently repeated to form a pattern that Table you can use. Table charges on Azure, Hungarian, thank you. Yes, I know. So, Whereas in the other case, in, in the first case, looking for charges, we're going through many, many roles trying to find one thing. Here we're going through many, many roles trying to find the same thing several times. This is made a little bit more difficult by the fact that, you know, some famous people were in lots of roles. So you may find lots of examples, but they're all the same family. And that doesn't count. <laughs> you need to find different examples. So, for example, let's take a, a here's our first example. Uh, Sable animate charges on ghouls, right? If this is what you're looking for, black charges on red, uh, even animate charges like people or wings or, that's actually a human head, you can't oh, tell. I can right? mm -hmm. or, or twisty snakes or wings or anything like that, th then get another example of that and you'll be able to do something of, sim of comparable simplicity. I have that, a question. Yeah. Do we know that those charges are actually sable, or are they argent that have tarnished? Mm. We know in this case that they are sable. Okay. All right, but you're, you're raising a valid point, which I will get to later on in the discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, in Thank you, Madam Schill. But <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, Z yeah. Marcus Wappen book is actually, definitely a lot of those were sable, but some of them may have been copies of things that were not sable. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll get to that. All yes. right. But anyway. If this, this is all we wanted to do, this would be sufficient documentation. But none of these, would, none of these examples would support counterchanging a charge over red and black. It's like per pale, sable and ghouls, a thing, counterchange ghouls and sable. None of these are sufficient documentation for that. That's not the pattern we see here. Next slide. That's the pattern we see here. <laughs> all right. But only for pale. So, but, only, yeah, but only for purpose. So the, the point is, however, You've got to, you, if you're going to do an individually attested pattern, you must document that pattern. Yes. It's not enough to say, oh, I've got lots of examples of black on red, because if you're registering something, something something like this, then this is what you need to document. And again, let me emphasize again, it must be of comparable design, comparable simplicity. In other words, all of these have, you know, one charge, two charges, two identical charges, or one charge, all right? Your submission had better be the same. Don't give me a, a counter-changed eagle and not a chief three bullet and the whole thing counter-changed and, you know... Or our case, which is two rotated eagles. Yeah. Don't do that. And black on red is not support for red on black. Yes. That's also yeah. true, although we, 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 might, we, might, we might cut you a little bit of slack on that, particularly if it's something... It's not a draft, it's, it's supporting, it's, a, it's what they consider to draft. Right. All right. All right, next slide, please. All right, so... The third documentary use is more of an artist's point of view and seeing how style and differencing evolved over time. All right? and this is, again, where the, all those roles of arms come in so valuably. Okay? Uh, because with them, we can actually see the progression of heraldic art and how it changed over time. Uh, first, next slide. So, for example, here are the same... For this, we want, we want to find the same coat of arms. We want the one family's worth and then wow. see how it changed. This is the same coat of arms, one from the Ingram Codex of 1460, and again from St. Walken Book of 1605. Same arms, ar ghouls on a fest, argent, a capital letter A, sable. But the capital letter A depends on your time period. Which sounds reasonable, actually. Which is very reasonable. You'll see that a lot. Uh, if somebody who's got, who's got uh, uh, helmets as their charges. In the early period, it'll be a barrel helm. 
the same charge, same bond, coat of arms the later period, will have a visor helm, a bar Is helm. Is that why we stop blazing the hand? Uh, probably, yeah. Well, the only reason we would blazing the hand at all is as a guide to the artist. Yeah. We certainly don't brand any different for it. Those are the same arms. Right, they are. We get no difference with that letter A. Originally, we were blazing this hand they were written, and we no longer do that. We don't? I thought we did. A, a, at least it a little bit, like Batar. Nope. But not, not 13th century Gothic Batar as drawn by, you know. No, we don't do it at all anymore. Okay, well, there it is. But if, if so, then that's the reason why. It has to be in a period hand. Though. It has to be in a period hand. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, no Comic Sans, thank you very much. <laughs> Actually, no Comic Sans, ever. period. Ever, ever. <laughs> no impact. <laughs> all right, next slide. All right, here, oh, this is, a, this is a good example. I found like 10 different coats from 10 different rolls of the same coat of arms, the arms of Zinger or Zinger. These are Smith's tongs. And we know that because of the cant with Zenga, which is tongs. Do right. they really change orientation, or are they looking at... Now, in some cases, you can tell which way is supposed to be the dexter on the arms because, because of the way that the helm and crest face. Mm -hmm. Because German rules in particular would, would have, if you've got two coats, they, they, they make them face each other. All right. so, they turn all, so they turn all the charges on one of them to face sinister. Right. Well, we have, but you can tell that they did that because they also turned the helm. That's why I'm asking you. Looks like I can. No, the helms, the helms are definitely pointing in that direction. All right. So, no, I don't think so. I think they're both pointing this way. Yeah. No, that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But you know, this is this is as early as we get that from the Armorial Bellenville, Armorial Bellenville, circa 1370, uh, going on to Schneebler's Armorial of 1450, the Ingram Armorial of 1460. Given uh, those depictions, especially the 1460, I don't see why we would grant difference for the, which way they face. Well, uh, well, a couple of them, you know, it's very obvious that the, that the artist in question had never seen tongs in his life. <laughs> we get a lot of that, quite frankly. In fact, we'll, we'll get to that you know, again. We'll get to that in a minute. Thank you for anticipating me. But uh, I kind of like the French one here. That one, that one, that's the only one of these that is drawn by a, a well, that one's drawn by a French, but that one's drawn by a French man. You can notice that he took some artistic pains. But this also sets the limit to what our artistic style can be, you know. Some of them have, some, some, sometimes the arms have a little bit of a flex to them, all right? Sometimes the, the, the plant is a little bit open, sometimes it's got teeth. One thing you'll never see is a pistol grip, mm -hmm. yeah. all right? So there are limits to what we can call artistic license, all right? We and, need to class on that. Huh? <laughs> class on that. Uh, somebody is today. Somebody is. Yes. Yeah, probably at the same time I'm teaching you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, sorry. All right. Yeah, it's the second half of this class in another room. I won't be offended if you have to leave. All right. <laughs> but then, next slide. Please. All right. So sometimes this can have unfortunate consequences. As the charges change their, their style, they also change their identity. All right. Here we have two arms which you, know, you probably swear are the exact same charge, right? This is the arms of von Schubenberg and the arms of von Frankenstein. Yes, the arms of von Frankenstein. Yes, yes. yes. Frankenstein. Frankenstein. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I sure thought it was Green Hornets. I knew so much. I was going to say it. <laughs> but these are both like, uh, these are all both, both from the Armour of Bell and Bill, like 14, 1380. All right. And those arms continue to exist right to the end of our period. Next slide, please. But as you can see, one of them changed dramatically. Oh, yeah. Oh, Frankenstein yeah. became an axe head. And if you look up the blazon nowadays, that's exactly what it is. Drawn as an axe head, blazon as an axe head. All right? It also changed orientation. Up, uh, facing the other way. Well, it started, going, it started being started bendwise. It tailwise and then now it's bendwise. Yeah. Uh, I have found that they were pretty uh, uh, casual about things that were tailwise versus bendwise. Uh, we, we grant much more of the difference with that than I think they would have. But that's a story for another time. Uh, meanwhile, Schubenberg down here, we'll notice that it kind of kept its basic form. In some cases, we each had a little bit of a rope here, which tells us what it was used for. Uh, essentially, it's a forester's tool. All right, or it was a forester's tool, and you would like you have either to catch the catch the branches up there and pull them down, or maybe hang a piece of meat meat on it to to to, to snare a beast, or even I've seen one example where you thunk it into the side of a tree and then use the rope to create a, a temporary barrier. All right, all right. So it's an all-purpose tool. All-purpose tool for forester's tool, but it was an all-purpose forester's tool back in 1380. I think they stopped using it by 1605 because, as you can see, it looks almost like an anchor here. Yeah. Right? Well, and, and they flipped it over. And they flipped it over. 
in the more yeah. recent Von Frankenstein. Uh -huh. Well, I probably flipped it over because that's what anchors do. That's a very odd way to put the half through an axe. Yeah, <laughs> that's where the pin, the the wedge goes in. It's at right angles to where you put it, put the half per an axe. Mm -hmm. Period. Well, if you look the 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 lions have no digestive tracts because there's no room for them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think the, 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 the handle of the axe would still go through, and then they would put the wedge maybe, to keep the maybe. handle. Maybe, or maybe this is just a way of saying there's a hole in it. Yeah. 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 Dear Liza, dear Liza. Yeah. All right, so but the, the point is, as artistic... Style evolved. The very nature of the charge can evolve, and this is, this is some. This is something that's, and this is why we give no difference between the charge we call a ferro loop and an axe head. Because we give one between it and an anchor. Huh? It's never come up as far as I know. Okay. Next slide. Then there's usually an orientation uh, difference. The other thing for this is that very often these period rolls of arms will include entire families, and we can see what differencing they used. All right. I was lucky in this. I was lucky in this one because German differencing was almost always involved with the crest. The arms might be identical for different branches of the family, but the crest would change. Here we've got the same charge in the arms, the same charge in the crest, and the only difference is tincture. Right? So, and that's the sort of thing that you would find only by going through a lot of uh, period rolls. Right, next slide. Okay. Now, caveats. All right. When you're looking through these rules, it is possible to uh, fall into one of the many traps that are strewn about uh, setting of traps. And uh, so, the, and the first trap, and the, obviously the one that we can guard against most easily, and that which we must guard against at all times, is the fact that we make mistakes. We ourselves, looking at these rules, don't see them as they would have been seen in period. For example, here is a coat of arms uh, from. Uh, from uh, uh, an English roll, uh, circa 1550, and um, I've had people bring this up to see. See, they had swastikas. It's a war wheel. Nope, not that. Any other guesses what it might be? A few crampons and saltire? Almost. Next slide. Two uh, glass cutters in saltire. Oh, two things in saltire. Yeah, two rosing irons in saltire. All right. Just and those also look more now like Paris. This is just a bad drawing. That's, it's bad heraldic art. You know, so every time somebody tells you, everyone, everyone wants to tell me bad heraldic art is period, and I want to say, yeah, but bad heraldic art is bad. Bad heraldic art is confusing. All right, so, so always when you see something that seems too good to be true, see if you can find another example of the same arms from the same time period. And, uh, Besides, the reason why we don't write just swastika has nothing to do with how period. I'm well aware of it, but people are going, blah, 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 blah. Right. Next slide, please. Were that supposed to be pairs? Yes, those were yeah. pairs. Go back. They're, they're not they're, they look like boots on the no, first these, one. These are four pairs, yes. Okay. All of them on board during grace. So someone could also go and say, hey, look, they do modern teardrops. No, those are pairs. No, those are pairs. <laughs> right. Next slide. Okay, so here's an example from, what, what is that? The Manessa? Yeah, it's Manessa. Black on blue. Uh, and it's black on blue. It sure is black on blue. No so doubt about it. We documented know. black on blue. Next slide. Yes. Until we can look for another page in the same book and we can document black on black. It's silver leaf that's tarnished. Yeah. All right. Silver leaf or the, the lead pipe that they used uh, would uh, tarnish uh, when exposed to the atmosphere. Uh, sulfur is particularly bad, but just leaving it exposed for a long enough period and you end up with black. I've seen one roll of arms that uh, essentially had the coat of arms of Brittany as sable. <laughs> and you had to like look at it with the light glancing off of it to say that some of the sable was a flat black and some of the sable was glossy ermine tails. And essentially they painted black ermine tails on silver leaf and the silver leaf turned black. It happens. So we can make mistakes and we have to be on guard against them. Right? That's why the, who was talking earlier about the, the black on black on... Uh, Black on red. Black on red in, 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 yeah. that we found in seed marker. The, the reason we, we appear, feel confident about that is that no gold leaf was used and most of the yellow white has stayed white. Now we do have the, the issue that maybe if he copied somebody else's work and it had tarnished, he would have made a mistake. That's, that's true, but and, uh, that would be a hard thing to prove. Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly suspicious of some of the black and blue stuff in Z-Marker for that one, most yeah. of the black on red. Yeah, next but, slide. But again, unless you actually find the older arms, you won't know. Yeah. Sometimes, Sometimes, Sometimes the artist know. never finished. <laughs> In Scotland. Scotland. A very, very pale Scotland. <laughs> yeah. 
It happens. I mean, you know, we, we get these things in all in all states. And, and I've uh, seen rolls of arms where you can tell that someone did a whole bunch of shield shapes, and then someone else filled them in. Yes. Uh, the, the, more than one artist was, was responsible for a great many of these, and sometimes they didn't finish before the money ran out. Well, that's tricked, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, has, I see a G. It, it is tricked, yes. Yeah. G for gold, and then R for rata, red. But, uh... Which is another way that you can be sure that you are looking at red on black in some right. cases, because so there are ones. There, there are, there are the, the uncolored versions. What? But yeah, so that's the other thing you look for. This is not documentation for, for metal on metal. Right. There is documentation for metal on but metal. But this, this is it is. is. Yeah. All right. Next slide, please. All right. So, we make mistakes. Hey, guess what? So period heralds make mistakes, too. And sometimes the heralds or the artists or both make mistakes. And sometimes these can have unfortunate consequences. Mm -hmm. For example, these are the arms of the Kingdom of Jerusalem, taken from a number of sources, all from the same time period, all from the same area. One of these is not like <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Maybe he just couldn't believe it was metal on metal. No, because he also did the one right next to it. <laughs> these are from the same role by the same artist. Oh dear. Oops. <laughs> he had a brain fart, all right? <laughs> Happened. Or his apprentice did, or something. Or somebody did, but something happened. You know, a cosmic ray shower disrupted his neurons for that critical moment. Who knows? Ran out of gold. Ran out of no. That's, <laughs> that's actually a theorem. Um, so, for the gold. So anyway, yeah. well, and you know, it was you know, he did it in the mantle, he did it in the crest. He's like, you know, it was a deliberate decision, yes. Or, or, or he just got stupid. Or, 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 or like she who knows? Who knows? But the point is, it's, it's a, an it, 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 it's yeah, a mistake. Yeah. It's a mistake. Yeah, they yes. made them, yeah. all right? You cannot take even period roles as 100% gospel because they were just as fallible as y'all are. Mm. I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about y'all. <laughs> 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 all right? But, so, and again, so always be uh, wary about this. Usually if you've only got the one example of a particular coat, you kind of have to assume it's all right, but something for Jerusalem, where you've got literally hundreds of examples of it throughout history, you know, from its founding in whatever it was, the First Crusade, uh, you know that's a mistake. Accept it as a mistake. All right, next slide. All right. Sometimes, uh, again, if you can compare different sources, you can see how charges evolve, and sometimes they evolve into new charges, and sometimes they make mistakes. This is kind of halfway in between. This is from uh, the Stamaro Trevolziano. Uh, this was a Melanese role. Uh, this was like... 1450-ish, they're about these are the arms of Dorocus. Those are chess rooks. Mm -hmm. If nothing else, the, uh, the, arm, the, the cant with the name of Dorocus yeah. uh, would have told you that. Here's the exact same arms 100 years later. Oops. They become <laughs> cups. So, it happens. I love them. It's interesting, the bottom one's actually drawn in. Uh, yeah, well, he, he knew they were cups, and then he gave you, well, that looked like a cup. You know, he, just was, he didn't understand what he was looking at. You know, somebody who's painting a roll of arms isn't necessarily a herald. We'd like it to be, but it's not true. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, and finally, one of my favorites, the Lamia. This should, this is, I pulled this example to show that even our authoritative sources, the grants of arms, can make mistakes. Particularly when you got to be the guard king of arms because your daddy was guard king of arms. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that did happen. But anyway, the, first, the, the charge is a monster called a Lamia. All okay. right? Now, Lamias have a long history, but by Elizabethan times, they had turned into kind of something with the body of a lion and the tail of a horse and head and breast of a woman, all right, and cloven hooves in the back and human hands in the front, and, but it belonged to the arms of Lambert. It was a, it was a cant, again, Lamias for Lambert. All right? The grants were exemplified about 100 years later, and uh, slightly, slight changes to drawing, but not significant changes to drawing, but the king of arms at the time misblazoned it as a manticore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you read the bestiaries, you know that manticores have scorpion tails. This cannot possibly be a manticore. In addition to missing the scorpion tail, he's got two things that no manticore would have. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> so that's how I know this was a mistake. I don't. I don't care how authoritative the source. I can identify mistakes. All right. So finally, third set of caveats. Opinions are not necessarily facts. This is a uh, a problem with the heraldic treatises most of all because being written documents and called from a lot of places and not necessarily citing where they got the stuff, they were free to insert 
their own opinions in these boy, things. Did they. And boy, did they. It's like, um, uh, like for example, let's see, what is it? Uh, I give, I've got an example in here. Well, for example, this one's from Willem, and I love this one. Um, when you were blazing, well, in addition to like tracing the history of heralds back to Alexander the Great and their things, like a, and, their, and coats of arms all the way back to Adam and Eve, anyone know what Adam's arms are? I've seen them actually. Ghouls. Oh, ghouls. Okay. And he courted them with his wife's arms, which were Argent. So, okay. okay. There it is. <laughs> yeah, you can believe that. But, uh, for example, Willem states that there is a different word for every kind of semi. And I'm not just talking about besanty for semi of besants or crucially for semi, semi of uh, crosses. No, I'm thinking, talking in our lawn of martlets, inerni of lion cells, verdoy of trefoils. Oh, you used a different word for semi yeah, for every. It, it sounded exactly yeah. like that. And toyer of besants. You know? Well, yeah. now, if, if he could, now, now, if he could actually have convinced one of the sovereigns of arms to do this, then yes, he'd have been absolutely right. And that did happen. The, the heraldic treatises are the ones that gave us blazing by planets. You know, where uh, where ghouls is Mercury and ore is soul, right? And so on down the line. And uh, there were actually a couple of grants of arms that actually did that. But but in general, the treatises, if you see something like that, you know, when they talk about the signification of the charge. They are pulling it out of some orifice. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's, let, uh, let's take, let's take a, a wonderful example. Uh, uh, here's uh, Lee's accidents of armory, and he talked about abatements of arms. Mm. Now, these are the arms that you would add to your have to add to your arms. Charge you have to add to your arms if you're convicted in a court of chivalry of any of several heinous offenses like cowardice before the face of the enemy or being rude to women or you know any of the other things against the code of chivalry. And you know you're pretty sure that. If you were the guy who had to sit in that code of chivalry, and you were told, okay, you've got to add a gore sinister to your arms from now on, and all your children have to wear it too, you'd probably go, yeah, I don't think so. I know, I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'll stop wearing arms before I do that. You know, like, and these were never used. We have no examples of a gore sinister used anywhere in any code of arms. The only place it exists is an abatement of arms in period heraldic treatises. We allow it in the SCA for exactly that reason, but for only that reason. It's not a used charge. You want to know what they did for abatement of arms? Let me show you. Next slide. Right? They, they defaced you. They painted over your shield in red, or they cut through it, and you couldn't complain because you were dead. You, know, you were attainted and beheaded. This is what happened to Bishop John Fisher when he decided he was still Catholic. This is, this is what happened to, the, to Henry Howard, the Earl of Surrey, when he was actually bearing arms that he was entitled to, but they included the royal arms, and Henry didn't like that. And after they were beheaded, then they went back and you know, this was the abatement of arms that you can see, period. All right. We don't do that in the SCA. <laughs> I don't know. All right, so I think that's, yeah, that's it. That's it. So in conclusion, given the caveats, given the caveats that I've just described, the last page that I've got you has a lot of resources that, that, that uh, you, can you turn the lights over there? So that people can see. All right. Again, I mentioned that there are no comprehensive collections of, of grants of arms that I know of. If you find one, let me know. Oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah. Comprehensive, yeah. I would love to have no one. I would like, yeah. But the number of rules of arms are, are great, and uh, while I have not made a collection of all of them, I know two people who have, and I've given you their websites you can go to, and you have yeah, Koblet uh, and uh, Gunvor. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. And, and uh, then, I've, then I've also cited a, a, few, uh, a few things that are still only in text. I should probably have mentioned that, you know, almost as good as the roll of arms are ordinaries made from period rolls of arms, of which there are a few. The most recently completed is the Dictionary of British Arms. It's so all out it's now. A, it's all out now. It's a four-volume set. If you've got, like, 500 bucks to drop on something, that's the people uh, they drop They were costing about $70 per, so... 70 Yeah. I had to pay 110 for the damn thing. Well, I bought one of them was 70 something for Juliana. I don't, I don't remember how much I bought the last one. Oh, you've got a used one. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> Does it still work? <laughs> it still works. It still works. And period treatises, again, there are some of those online. You can, you can find Willem online. But you can't find Willem's first edition online, at least I have it. You can yeah. find like the fifth edition or sixth edition, but that's way out of our period. You can How much did they change from earlier editions to later editions? He, he, added, he mostly added stuff. 
but the, which means that you know any you don't know anything is additional or whether. But uh, Lee's Exceedance of Armory and Boswell's Works of Armory are both available online. And, uh, yeah. and the French Treatise is online too. I think so, yeah. Uh, I have no Works of Arms. I have used the Academy of St. Gabriel's mm -hmm. armorial references. Is that included in or overlapping with the two lines I, I, I that think you have I, I, think, I think at this point the Academy of St. Gabriel's list is a subset of the ones you will find here. Okay. Uh, I suspect. If someone wants to go, particularly someone who is relatively new with this, and perhaps update that list, That'd be awesome, and right? check to make sure that the links, because for example, that Bavarian website thing, they changed their links a while back. Ah, yes. yeah. A lot of the yeah, the B, oh, you'll yeah. see it. You'll see it referenced as the BSD, the Bayerische Staatsbibliothek, yeah. the Bavarian State Library. It, it's a and, great source, but, oh, gosh, it did. but yeah, they updated their website. They updated the, the links. So Saint Gabriel's been in retirement since 2006, so a lot of our current practices are not ascribed to the site. Well, the, the, yeah, but, but the, so, the, this site is just, here are period rules of rows. That's yeah, all it is. Yeah, it's just a link to the rules. And, so. mm -hmm. and I suspect but, if someone know, wanted to go through and update it, you, you get it to Ursula Aria and they'll update it for you. It's not... Yeah. You know, there's a check of the link. There's a link still correct, and if not, find the correct link. And take and perhaps take this site and add more links. You need to add like a pair. You need to add a sentence of description what the link points to, and that's about it. I, I, again, I would, if if I were doing, I, I use a certain amount of judgment about what links I would include because a lot of these links, as I say, the art is execrable. In my well, you know, what St. Gabriel tends to do is they tend to give the caveats. Yeah. In the description of the link, yeah, which is actually where the most brain work involved. Well, what are the caveats for this particular site? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Any, any questions about anything else then? While, while you got me here, anything, anything at all? I was actually looking at. I, I hadn't actually found too many examples of period blazons in general. I, 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 was, I assume your sources, which I don't have a handout at the moment. Um. Uh, no, we can find a certain PhD thesis. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's a question I was going to ask her because she has mm. she she did she did a, this whole dictionary of period sources, so she has access to period blazons. Um, though some of it is com sometimes you come down to the what is that charge or you know I'm curious about that that Duke of Portugal has that little thin little line down his armory. Yeah. I've I've seen it more than once. Mm -hmm. I have no clue what it is. Interesting. And the only blazon that's seen are educated people afterwards, but they, they overblazon. Well, uh, if we can't get a hold of Madame Boudreau's work, uh, uh, Jean Brault's uh, early blazon yes, is indispensable for something mm -hmm. like this, if you can get a copy of that. Uh, that doesn't work for Iberian in either case, unfortunately. Well, no, but no. Yeah. The question might be more for your other class, but huh. so if you've got somebody who, say, wants to do Polish arms, mm -hmm. and the early Polish arms, they were doing the clan markings and stuff mm -hmm. as their arms, which we can't pass in the SCA, can we? Yeah, that's a question for Manic class. Yeah. It depends on what the mark looks like. Nothing that you can even well with the angle. Yeah. Yeah. Because it also needs to be a little bit of 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 a little